Hello there, my name is Patrick Denny and welcome to this presentation uh, which you can see is entitled Starvation or Surrender, the Siege of Colchester. Now during the, the summer of 1648, in June, July and August, Colchester was besieged by a large parliamentarian army and it's got to have been one of the most dramatic events ever to have taken place in the town throughout its you know long history and that siege was only lifted when the people of Colchester were forced to surrender because they were they were getting near to starvation in fact their choice was a simple one it was either starvation or surrender so why did the siege take place in the first place well the siege of Colchester was part of the English Civil War in fact, it was actually part of the Second English Civil War, which basically was a battle between the supporters of King Charles I, the Royalists, and the supporters of Parliament, you know, the Parliamentarians. Sometimes they're called the Cavaliers and the Roundheads. And what sparked this off really was that King Charles I believed very much in the divine right of kings, um, whereby he believed that he received his authority directly from God. So in other words, all decisions that he made were inspired by God. So he didn't need to, um, you know, he couldn't be held accountable to parliament or in fact to anyone else. And this eventually, you know, led to a, a standoff between the king and parliament and ultimately they went to war. The first civil war um, began in 1642. It lasted four years. And in 46, 1646, the, um, the king was defeated. Um, he eventually um, was imprisoned on the Isle of Wight. And everybody probably thought, oh, thank goodness, you know, that, that's over, four years of war. But in, early in 1648, there were various groups around the country, particularly in the south of England, who um, were royalist sympathisers. And particularly in Kent, um, a man called George Goring, who was the Earl of Norwich at the time, um, began to raise an army of royalist sympathisers to um, you know, fight against Parliament and to obviously um, try to get the king released. So what happened, um, there, was, there was quite a lot of support for this. They, um, they took over the towns of Rochester and Maidstone in Kent, but they were quickly repelled by Thomas Fairfax, Thomas Fairfax was the leader of the, he was the commander in chief of the parliamentarian army at that time. And he routed them out. Um, and what happened then, Goring and his forces um, started to march towards London, where they thought they might get some support. But eventually they decided to cross into Essex um, to get more support there. So they eventually crossed the Thames um, and recruited more. And they, they made their way from there via Brentwood, Chumpsford, and, and they went round via Braintree uh, to Colchester. Colchester was their target. That's where they were heading for. And the idea was that, um, you know, hopefully they could recruit more support from that town, pick up lots of provisions and possibly make their way up north. So that, that's basically the, the background, a bit of background for you. But should we now have a look and see what we can um, have a look at some of the slides? And I thought we'd just have a quick look at some of the key players. And this is only a few of them. But um, so first of all, we've, we've got King Charles I. So he was the main instigator in this, wasn't he, really? It was, it, was, it was his belief that he wanted to rule without asking authority from anybody else, and um, which started the whole ball rolling. On the right, we've got Thomas Lord Fairfax, who was the parliamentarian leader. Here we've got two, we've got one royalist and one parliamentarian. So on the left hand side, we've got Arthur Lord Capel. He was a peer of the realm, um, one or two or three in Colchester, and he was a, a staunch royalist. Um, unfortunately, uh, at the end of the surrender, he was one who lost his life. Not in Colchester, but he, he died in London. On the right hand side, we've got Colonel Henry Ireton. And you'll note we've got names, some of the road names in Colchester are named directly after some of these people. Colonel Henry Ireton was a very staunch parliamentarian. And it's been suggested that at the end of the siege, um, at the time of the surrender, when the death sentence was passed on some of the captains, some of the royalist officers, that um, had it been left to Fairfax, he may well have been persuaded to let them live another day. But uh, apparently um, Ireton was all for it and he pushed for it 
and um, that's what actually happened. And he was also a signatory on the death warrant of King Charles I. He was one of the people pushing for him to be executed as well. And if we look on the death warrant of King Charles I, we can see lots of names, but we can just around here we can we can see Henry Ireton's um, name just here. Henry Ireton, of course, had married Cromwell's daughter Mary, and um, the pair of them were very close friends. And now we've got Lucas and Lyle. Charles Lucas, of course, was um, they're both royalist captains, and um, he was from a Colchester family. His family held um, they had the big house on St John's Green, which was formerly part of the St John's Abbey lands. His father, his elder brother, rather, was um, Sir John Lucas. And, um, and on the right hand side, we've got Sir George Lyle. He was from Hertfordshire. Um, and these two men were the two who lost, uh, ultimately lost their lives um, at the time of the surrender. And two more before we move on from this, we've got Sir Bernard Gascoigne on the right hand side. Um, again, he was a, a, um, a royalist. Um, captain who at the surrender was also sentenced to death but um, that sentence wasn't carried out and we'll, we'll see talk about that right at the end. On the right hand side we've got George Lord Goring who in the first civil war had been made Earl of Norwich and he was the royalist leader. So that's the sort of scene set and um, I just want to talk a little bit about how do we know all this? How do we know all the facts and figures um, and what happened in Colchester, for example? Well, you know, what is the evidence? Well, the evidence we can divide into three different categories. The first one is eyewitness accounts. I think they're the best ones. If, if you can get a diary or an eyewitness account of someone who's actually there or heard directly from it, um, that's going to be a good account. Eyewitness accounts are comparatively rare, but there are a few, and um, I'll speak about those in a moment. The second useful source are things called news books or pamphlets. News books is, is the proper term. And, and they're a, a kind of early newspaper, I suppose. They started coming out in the early 17th century, reporting facts. Mainly, they were mainly for reporting things that are happening in war, mainly. And uh, by the time of the, um, the Civil War in the 1640s, uh, these were being produced in their hundreds every week. Um, it, it's been suggested that throughout the entire Civil War, um, 20, 25,000 of these news books had been published and printed by both sides, mainly by Parliament. And what they do, they give people news on what was happening at the various battles, and, you know, the Battle of um, St John's Green, for example, or the Hive, and you can, people could read up you know, what was happening at the time. Um, there's a very large collection of news books about Colchester, the siege, in Colchester Library. Now, you have to ask for these. They're, they're in the vaults. And I remember going in there once and asking for some, and they said, which one do you want? I said, well, I don't really know. I said, can you bring them all down? <laughs> and they brought about 300 down on a big trolley. So they have got a lot there. There's also a large collection at the Bodleian Library as well in Oxford of, of Colchester ones. So they're very useful. And then we've got letters and correspondence. So these are people writing letters, people who lived in Colchester at the time were writing letters to their friends and relations, reporting what was going on. And some of these letters, believe it or not, were actually written during the siege and obviously sent out during the siege. Um, and, you know, correspondence was coming in. So it did happen. So what about these eyewitness accounts? Well, the first one and the most detailed one is by Matthew Carter. Matthew Carter was a Kentish man and he was a quartermaster general in the king's forces and um, he was one of the many taken prisoner um, at the time of the surrender and sometime during that time he wrote his diary up and it's it's certainly the most um, detailed one and it was published first of all in London in 1650 there's there's been various editions since then come to that in a moment the next um, diary if you like uh, can be found in what are called the round papers or the round manuscript uh, this is the Round family of Birch, and their papers have now found their way into the Essex Record Office. And among those family papers is a copy, an 18th century copy, of an eyewitness account of the siege. And it's quite useful because it, it speaks about lots of things that Carter's account doesn't. For example, particularly on the beginning of the war. 
um, which, which is quite useful. Um, then there's um, a diary of the siege in Daniel Defoe's, two of the eastern counties. Now that um, is remarkably like the round manuscript. And I, I, I'm pretty sure they probably come from the same source, from the same one. And then finally, the other, now these three that I've spoken first, Matthew Carter, the round and the Daniel Defoe one, they're all written from a royalist viewpoint. Okay. And then the, the last one, the diary and map of the siege of Colchester is written from a parliamentarian viewpoint. So I'll, I'll show you, talk a bit more about some of those um, as, as we go on. So first of all, Matthew Carter's account. So here it is, first published in 1650. This edition you're looking at, which I've got in my library, is 1788. And um, they're quite old books. Um, you can buy them occasionally, they're quite expensive. Um, you can read them in the library, although it's very unlikely they'll let you borrow it in the library. And, um, and, and they're generally fairly fragile. And even if you get hold of one that's quite readable, um, they're quite difficult to read, really, compared with modern day viewpoints. Um, you know, there's no illustrations, there's no indexes. It's just writing, writing in very small text. And, it, you know, for example, if you wanted to, if you said, well, where does it say about the siege house? Um, and, unless you put a marker in there or written, you'll have a job to find it. But anyway, it's, it's a very good detailed account. Now, a few years ago, 2002, a colleague of mine who sadly since passed away by the name of John Hedges and I, we decided to, well, John really did, um, to produce a, like a facsimile copy of Carter's account. And there it is. Um, that's where I got the title of this talk from, Starvation or Surrender, Matthew Carter's Siege of Colchester. And it's an authentic copy. Um, obviously, you haven't used exactly the same typeface, but we're, the, the, the text is identical. We've tried to keep that as accurate as it is. But the beauty of this um, edition is that we've been able to put lots of illustrations in, um, several indexes. So there's an index of subject, there's an index of people, for example. So you can quickly find anything you want in Carter's account. Um, we've also got a, a biographical section where some of the key players, a, a little bit about them, there's a word glossary. Some of these terms in the Civil War are, are not familiar to some people today. And um, there's also a map, the map that I mentioned earlier, the parliamentarian map and plan, diary and map. Um, well, the diary is in the book, although we've separated it from the map. Normally, the, the map and diary are on the same document. We've separated the, so you've got the parliamentarian diary in there as well. And the map is separate as um, a little fold tuck away that goes um, at the back of the book. So um, that's that one. Um, here is um, the actual diary of the siege. And um, so this was published, um, I'm not sure exactly, probably about 16, well, it's, it, it's, it's, it's dated 1648, but they, they always came out a bit later. And this has been published various times. But um, what you've got is the, the map of the siege in the, in the front here, in the centre, which is a war map of Colchester showing all the forts, all the trenches and so on and so forth, which we'll come on to in a moment. And then around the outside, from a parliamentarian viewpoint, you've got a, a day by day almost blow of how the siege is unfolding. And you can sort of follow it around and it finishes down the bottom here. It's quite big. I've just put this to give you an idea. When you unfold it, it's quite a fairly large, it's sort of an A2 type size. And right at the end, I'll, I'll I'll um, share with you um, where you can get easy copies of that. What about secondary sources? Well, there are, I mean, there's lots and lots of secondary sources. I mean, th there's so many. But um, until fairly recently, you found that a lot of secondary sources on the Civil War generally um, gave scant attention to Colchester, believe it or not. Despite the fact that we had a siege that lasted for three months. You're lucky enough to find a mention um, about Colchester. And several years ago, probably 20, 25 years ago, I forget where we were, we were on a holiday somewhere, maybe in a National Trust shop, and I saw this book, and it's a, it's a good book. I'm not deriding the book. It's, it's, it's a lovely book on the Civil War, hardback, glossy pages, lots of pictures and all the rest of it. And, and the reason why I purchased it, because it, it was quite cheap, I thought, well, I'll have that. I didn't look at it at the time. When I got home, straight to the index, let's look up all the Colchester references. 
and uh, there's about two. Um, one of them is this um, copy of a news book, which you can see on the left hand side. And the, the rest of the information about Colchester could easily fit in half a page. So I was quite disappointed that Colchester didn't get the recognition really. Um, but then uh, from that time onwards, things have improved a bit. On the left hand side, we've got Phil Jones's The Siege of Colchester, 1648, that came out in 2003. And that is entirely about Colchester. So that's, um, that's obviously much improved. But I think for me, um, the best secondary source that I know of is this one on the right hand side here, War in England, 1642 to 1649 by Barbara, Barbara Donegan, which came out in 2008. And um, now Barbara is obviously an academic and um, she has really been everywhere to research this book. You know, National Archives, um, you know, British Library, you name it, record of it here, there and everywhere. And it's, it's fully referenced. Um, she hasn't left a stone unturned really. But for me, what made me happy when I started reading this book is that the back third of the book is all about Colchester. Um, and it's really worth having. It's expensive. I, I think I pay £60 or more for that. But, um, but you can get it in, in, it might be obviously cheaper now, it will be. You pay £60 if you want it when it's published. Um, but anyway, um, so there's um, some examples. I, I will show you one or two more right at the end um, when we finish. But I just want to just talk very briefly how the two armies arrived at Colchester. Now, this is a map. Um, showing there's two dotted lines. This top one here is the Royalists. So they crossed over near Gravesend and the Isle of Dogs um, to Bow. They then made their way down to Brentwood, Chumpsford. And then they went via Lee's Priory, where they stopped off and helped themselves to their armory, their powder, about a hundred of their deer, and, and so on and so forth. Then on to Braintree, and then they arrived at Colchester on the outskirts of Colchester on the 12th of June. Fairfax, following behind them, crossed at Gravesend, Brentwood, and then virtually straight down the A12, if you like. And he arrived just 24 hours later on the 13th of June. What Fairfax had done, however, one of his colonels, Colonel Whaley, we've got a Whaley road, haven't we, in Colchester as well. Colonel Whaley had been told to follow the Royalist army. And with a, a party of horse, um, Colonel Whaley had followed them right the way from Kent into Essex and right the way down to Colchester. And um, he obviously kept his distance. They knew he was, th th that they were following, you know, the Royalists knew he was following them, but um, he kept far enough away. But he was obviously reporting back to Fairfax, telling them what was happening, where they're heading, and so on and so forth. And, um, you know, he was urging Fairfax to get here as quickly as possible. In the round, um, diaries in the round papers as an, an interesting little comment which you don't find anywhere else um, about Whaley and it says um, that on one occasion Whaley and 18 of his men were standing in the ripening corn at Lexton singing hymns to pass the time while they're waiting for Fairfax to arrive and I thought that was quite a nice touch can you imagine a group of soldiers today stand, standing in a cornfield singing hymns uh, they'd probably be singing anything other than hymns, but that just shows you what, you know, the, the population were, although they were divided religiously, they, religiously, they were kind of religious. They, they attended church regularly and singing hymns would have been a, a sort of normal thing for them. And, um, you know, when the war came out, people who were standing singing hymns together were at each other's throats. But I'm sure after the war, they were back again singing hymns together. But anyway, that's the kind of, um, that was the map. And on the 12th of June, the Royalist Army arrives at Colchester. Now, a few of the Royalist Army had, had come a bit earlier, two or three days earlier, to scout out the town, um, work out where they were going to put their cannon, their ordnance and so on. And, um, but anyway, the main Royalist Army comes on the 12th. Um, we don't know exactly, numbers vary, but probably over 5,000. Some people say five and a half thousand, some people say four thousand, but you know, we'll say about five thousand entered the town. You've got to remember the population of Colts is probably no more about 10,000, 11,000 at the time, all tightly packed, as you saw from that first map. You know, so all these people have got to be probably billeted with the household. So the, the people of Colts have got to put up, provide for these people, feed them, and all, all the rest of it. 
and there were terrible atrocities going on, which we're not going to mention too much about, but it, it was a, a terrible time. Plus all the horses and they've got to get food. Now they knew that Fairfax was hot on their heels. And one of the first things they did, they went down to the hive and they managed to secure lots of stocks of grain, powder, wine, and all sorts of things that were in the warehouses down there, bring them back into Colchester. Um, they also, although Fairfax eventually started to surround Colchester and besiege it, um, the Royalists did have access out of the East Gate uh, for, for many, many weeks, even on a nightly basis. Um, they were going out into the Tendering Hundred, rounding up sheep and cattle and so forth. They also held Hythe Church, down the Hive St. Leonard's Church, and they also held St. John's Green and the Lucas House and the Gate House for many weeks during the siege. But anyway, they came into Colchester on the 12th, and on the 13th, the next day, Fairfax arrives um, with his army. By now, he's probably got his army up to about 4,000, but um, because he's on the outside, he, he can increase his numbers um, all the time. But one of the first things he did was to ask them to surrender, so they, he ordered them to surrender, and when he got some rude messages back, um, he decided to launch an attack on the town there and then. And he, he did so on the 13th. And I say the round diary and the one in Daniel Defoe give an excellent account of this, this initial battle. If you look at Chapman Andre's map of um, Essex, particularly near the Colchester bit, 1777 this was brought out, and you'll see here, um, so there's Colchester, there's what we call the Lexton Road, there's Lexton. And at that time, of course, there was three or four hundred of Heathland. There was Stanway Heath and Lexton Heath. So Fairfax's troops are all encamped here. And um, according to the Round Diary, um, what the Royalists did, they set up their cannon, um, particularly in St Mary's Churchyard, which they called the Royal Fort. This is where the Art Centre is now. And, and later on, they also put a cannon up onto the top of the town, which we'll talk about later. And what they did to prepare for the attack, because they knew he was going to attack, because they refused his terms of surrender straight away. And they put regiments, I, I can't remember all the details, you'll have to read it yourself. But they, you know, a regiment in this field, a regiment in that field, cavalry here, cavalry there, regiment and reserve, regiment here. And right at the front, they had a, a group of volunteers, which was called the Forlorn Hope. You've heard of the forlorn hope before, you know, this is the, these are the volunteers who put themselves right in the, you know, the heat of battle, the high risk situation. You can liken it to the old films, you might have seen war films or western films or something like this when they're attacking a fort for example and they bring all the scaling ladders in and they rush in and put these ladders up and everyone's shooting at them and they're running up the ladders and, and of course the first people who go up these ladders they're usually killed very quickly and it's not until after a while they finally overwhelm them and the people behind them tend to be okay so those first ones is what they call a forlorn hope and quite often the the officers would pay them extra money they would give them rewards to take part in a forlorn hope and you often find that in, in, in civil war particularly many young people officers or other men would volunteer for that because if you lived, if you survived being in a fall on hope, you could be fast tracked promotion wise. But anyway, and that happens again later on in the talk. But anyway, back in the town about nine o'clock, it's reported, they, they heard the drums beating a sound um, and then they heard the drums going and then they saw them come over the top of the crest of the hill. And when they did that, they let loose their cannons in St Mary's Church and of course the cannon fire that was crashing on all these parliamentarian troops but rather than scattering the diary says they quickened their pace they quickened their pace and what they did they they wanted to get as close as they could to the royalists because they knew that if, the closer they got to the royalists they'd have to stop firing the cannon because they would be hitting their own men so that's what happened and to, to cut a long story short, we haven't got time for all this tonight, but the parliamentarians overwhelmed the royalists and forced them back into the town, right back to Headgate, and a pitch back took place there for several hours during that day. Um, at one stage, many of the parliamentarians had access to the town, they were in Head Street, they were then ambushed by royalists hiding in High Street and surprising them. And eventually, after several hours, 
and several hundred people killed on both sides, hundreds taken prisoner on both sides. They withdrew, the parliamentarians withdrew, they went back to Lexton, they forced the gates shut, uh, and that was that. Now Fairfax um, decided more or less there and then that he wasn't going to do that again. It's too risky um, and dangerous, so much lo loss of life. One thing that I forgot to mention earlier, when the Royalists were coming down through Essex, when they got to Chelmsford, Colonel Farr, who used to be a parliamentarian, but he, he changed sides. That was happening quite a lot during the war. He became for the Royalist side and he surprised and captured the, the Essex Committee for Parliament, who was sitting in Chelmsford at the time. Um, now this was a coup, it really was, about 20 of them. This is almost like, you know, many of them like what we might call cabinet ministers, really high profile, high profile people. And they kept them prisoner in Colchester during the entire siege of Colchester. They weren't released right to the very end, despite many attempts by Fairfax, and, uh, Fairfax under instructions from Parliament to get them out. And he offered many um, prisoners in exchange, but the Royalists weren't, weren't having any of it. So they kept them in the town. So Fairfax decided the next best thing, a traditional method, he would besiege the town. It would take time. And what he would do, he would try to build forts and defences all the way around the town, A, to stop them escaping, and B, to stop them getting supplies or anything in. But this would take time. And we know that for many weeks, they were sort of coming and going at leisure. So they started building on the western side to start with, then they slowly put the noose around, if you like, the whole town. But anyway, you start getting these news books now. This is the, one of the early ones. You'll see it's dated 15th of June. The battle was only the day before. And um, this is a parliamentarian one. They're all addressed to the um, Speaker of the House of Commons. The particulars of the fight at Colchester sent in a letter to the Honourable William Lenthal. Remember that name. William Lenthal, Esquire, Speaker of the Honourable House of Commons, and basically, this, this is what Fairfax said, and he wasn't quite correct here at the time, but anyway, the town is besieged, and 500 of the enemies were taken prisoners, 600 left the town, 60 that were killed buried in one churchyard, besides what was slain in the other part of the town, and he goes on to mention some of the people who, who were actually killed at that time. It's interesting, um, in another diary, these 500 prisoners he speaks about, now the Royalists also had prisoners, apparently Fairfax sent a message into Goring in Colchester, and they're always very polite when they send these messages, you know, they always sign off your humble servant, although they're at each other's throats, if you like, but Fairfax offered an exchange of prisoners, you know, more or less, like, we've got 500 of your prisoners, you've got 500 of ours, let's do an exchange. Well, Lucas and Lan and Goring and Colchester looked at this and thought, well, hang on a minute. So they, they sent a message back to Fairfax saying, well, hang on, we, who are these people? We've only got your word for it. You've got 500 of our prisoners. Can we have a list of all their names? Now, apparently this infuriated Fairfax and um, made him obviously quite angry. And what he actually did, and this shows you how people can change, I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like one in every 10 married men of these 500 and one in six of the bachelors he executed, um, you know, as kind of punishment because they, he, he thought they were disrespecting him, if you like. So here we've got um, this siege map on its own. Now you'll see in the top left, it's, um, it's dated 1648. Um, that doesn't actually mean too much because the, these maps were reproduced um, throughout the next 200 years, really. And although this is the, which appears to be the official version, there are other versions which are very similar. I think there's five or six of them. Um, for example, if you look here, this is East Street, there's the bridge, that's where the siege house would be. You'll see a little row of houses there, look. Now on some of the early maps, those houses aren't there. All you've got is a water mill. It's a small thing I know. On this map, it shows you the road to Wivenhoe. On some of the other early ones, that road doesn't exist. So there are differences. But anyway, this is the siege map. It's, it's, it's not meant to be an accurate map, and, and it's not accurate. The person who produced this map almost certainly wasn't a local person, because he makes a few mistakes. But what he did do, he started by using, by borrowing John Speed's map of Colchester, which I'll show you in a moment, as a starting point. 
So that's speeds, Matt. So he, he knew that was accurate. And then he sort of crudely, if you like, drew these roads out, radiating in all directions, and also adding these forts, which are obviously exaggerated in size, and then all the trenches and embankments all the way around the town. So that was the, the, the end plan, if you like. Um, he, now we know he wasn't local. I, I'll give you a couple of clues. This, this is obviously Magdalen Street here and Hyde Hill. This road here is what we would now call Military Road and Old Heath Road towards Fingwenhoe, and yet he's called it Mersey Road. Whereas in fact, Mersey Road is this one. And here where we, he's got like Butt Road and um, Molden Road, they're about 200 yards too far to the right. They should be here somewhere. But it wasn't meant to be accurate, not necessarily. It, it was a war map and it served its purpose. Um, just here, look, there's a couple. I mean, you could spend all day looking at this. It's an interesting. Just here, look, you've got Mr. Barrington's house. Now, Mr. Barrington, he was the mayor of Colchester uh, right at the end of the siege. As soon as the siege surrendered, he, he became mayor. And his house, you can see, has been bombarded or been set alight to probably by the royalists. So the parliamentarians can't use it as an advantage. They set alight to it. That was destroyed. And that is where Winsley's almshouses are now, not far away from that site there. So this is Speed's map from 1610. So that was the map that he used, this bit here. And um, after he'd, re he'd redrew that, if you like, he was able to add different things such as ordnance in the form of cannons you can see the little puff of smoke we've got two here um, there's St Mary's where the art centre is that that was called the Royal Fort and you can see a cannon here pointing you know that that's the way Fairfax was coming and notice look a little cannon on top of this tower little cannon up there there's some more houses that have been set alight down here look just outside North Gate uh, same as Mr. Barrington's house. Um, so, and, and you can, you know, I mean, there's lots of other points of interest you could have a look at. There's another couple of cannon here at the East Gate, look. And um, so he starts building the forts. He starts building the forts on the west side first. I think the first one was Fort Essex, which was nearer to Headgate. And then him, uh, Ewers Fort. These forts were named after the colonel's who captained them, if you like, looked after them. So Colonel Ewers, and this would have been on the site of um, where the Institute is and um, St. Helena School, that sort of area. And um, in the, and lots of smaller forts as well. Um, in the 1930s, when they were building the bypass, there was lots of excavations taking, on, taking place at Sheepen, and they found on the site of Ewers Fort, various little, this is just a small selection here, but they're in the museum, there's some, coinage from the, the time of the siege, a couple of keys, some musket balls, some powder measures, and some other various bits and pieces there as well. So on the 1st of July, so, so Fairfax started his siege you know, from the 14th, 15th of June, starts building these forts, and by the 1st of July they've started on building a fort at Grinstead Church. Now, this, this shows it in its completed form, but it would have taken a couple or more weeks to have achieved that. Grinstead Church, which is um, probably called St Andrew's Church, which is up on the Grinstead Estate, and it's, it's just off or on Forest Road on Grinstead Estate. It's a good mile away from Colchester, but um, Colonel Whaley set up a fort here. Remember, he was the one with his men singing hymns in a cornfield at Lexton, and so this is called Fort Whaley, and from here you can see his cannons. Um, so, you know, these cannons were capable of firing a cannonball well over a mile. You know, and in the, in the days of cannon fire, it really, in many cases, were very much hit and miss as to whether you, what you're aiming at, you actually hit or even get anywhere near it. So, you know, if from here you're aiming at the castle, you, know, you could hit the co-op, should we say, you could be, you could miss it entirely. But there were some expert gunners, and we'll speak about one later, but some expert gunners who knew exactly what elevation to use, how much powder, et cetera, et cetera. And if they're aiming for a house a mile away, they could almost drop it down the chimney. Um, there, there, were, there weren't very many of them around. But anyway, so um, 
just to remind you that up until early July, the Royalists had been freely able to come out of Eastgate, usually in the, under the cover of darkness, go out into the Tendering Hundred, bring in sheep, cattle, as many as they want, no problem at all. Fairfax was, he had to shut that out. That was one of the things he wanted to do. The second thing, he wanted to remove them from the hive. And the third thing, from St John's Green. And then finally, St Mary's Church. There was his sort of four targets, if you like. And um, so there is a, um, an engraving of the church. That's what it looked like in 1824. See the town in the distance, some of the windmills and some of the churches on display. And this is the first of a few pictures I'm going to show you by Charles Debenham. Now, many of you will know Charles Debenham. Um, he's an artist in Colchester. He's been so since around 1950. I mean, a long, long time. But um, and you'll often see him sitting on a stool with an easel, painting something in Colchester. But he also did a, about eight or nine siege pictures. Um, and I, I'll explain to you later if you want to know why I did that. But anyway, this is one of them. And this shows you, this is probably Whaley's horse, Colonel Whaley with his horse. Um, so we've got the castle, St. James Church, East Hill. Um, and there's the, there's the river and there's the bridge. So this is the route that the Royalists were coming out at night time going into the Tendering Hundred. And what Colonel Whaley's forces had done, the parliamentarians, had moved their front line right up to that bridge. So where the siege house is now in the mill, they actually occupied that, effectively cutting off their route out of the town. Now, of course, this incensed Lucas and Lyle and Goring, and they were determined they were going to break through. And on the 6th or 7th of July, we don't know the exact date because some of these accounts vary, um, unfortunately, but we have what we call the Battle for East Street. Now, what actually happened um, just after midnight, about 700 soldiers, about 200 horse and about 500 foot from the Royalist town, flew down the hill, you know, careered down the hill. Um, now, at that time, you only had a footbridge over the river. In fact, you only had a footbridge until early 1800s. But you certainly had a footbridge here. By the 1800s, it was a big brick one. Um, but, um, and most of the traffic went through the ford here. So they would have charged down here. And of course, they met up with opposition just over the other side here and a pitch battle took place. And um, we can see the damage left in, in some of the buildings. Um, to start with, the Royalists got the upper hand and they pushed the parliamentarians right back up to the Harridge Road area. And then, as often happens in war, a reversal took place and the parliamentarians got the upper hand. And eventually they were able to push the Royalists right back into the town, um, almost to within shouting distance from the Roman Wall. But um, this is an interesting picture. It's taken, obviously, the bottom of East Hill looking towards East Street. This field, mill field, is still there. Um, on the, the siege house, would, what we call the siege house, would be behind those trees there. And um, on the right here, you've got now a large house standing back, which formerly was the, um, the YMCA building. It's a private house now. And just to the left of that, there's a little old building here, look. Now, in 1775, roughly, that little building or barn was there. And that still survives just about, and it was some people called Doe's Mill. Now, I took a picture of that in 2011 when it was um, fairly complete, if you like. But sadly, in 2017, um, it got set alight by arsonists, I believe, and it was pretty much um, in a bad way. And only today, I went down there before this, I thought, I'll just see what's, what's happening. And um, it's still the same. Nothing's really happened. They've covered it up with a scaffolding, but um, it's just bare charred wood. I'm not even sure if there's as much survived now than there was um, four or five years ago. So it's not looking too good. Let's hope they do something with it because it's an important building, part of the history, part of this map, uh, this photo and um, this painting even. Now, uh, just a couple of reconstructions here. The bottom one is by Charles Debenham and uh, the top one, there's an earlier one published in one of the um, guides to Colchester. We're familiar with this site, of course, the, the siege house, and um, it got battered a bit. Now, in about 1905, um, the current owner, Wilson Marriage at the time, refurbished the building, 
and um, it was at that time covered in plaster. If you look at Charlie Brown's shop up here, many of you will remember Charlie Brown's. It used to, I mean, it, it's a smart place now, but it, the paint used to be falling off, didn't it? It was quite bad in a bad way. But that was authentic. That's what it should look like. And that's what the siege house looked like. And if Charlie Brown's had decided to chop all his plaster off and paint his beams black, it would look like that. So this is not the authentic version. But anyway, when they did take the plaster off, which was a fashion at the time, think of the Red Lion, think of Timberleys, they all did it, Rose and Crown. Um, they discovered all these bullets embedded in the timber work. So they decided to make a feature of them, put little ring, red rings around them. And you can see some here quite clearly. Also on this um, big oak post here, you can see some of these clearly here. It, it does show you the power of some of these muskets because these timbers even by 1648 were probably a hundred years or getting near a hundred years old and you know what oak goes like uh, over not that amount of time but certainly over a hundred years it's almost like rock and yet these bullets have embedded themselves they haven't ricocheted off they've embedded themselves into these timbers so it shows you what they would do with a human um, so very very dangerous if you um go to the left a little bit we're going to just go this way a bit here and you'll see um some more bullet holes up here and um the reason why i'm showing you these ones quite a few years ago now 25 years maybe plus um, a friend of mine was telling me a little story that his father had told him and his father used to work as a maintenance man or or, or did building work at the siege house and the mill and he said that on one occasion, his father told him that he had to replace some of these timbers. And he said some of the timbers had these red bullet holes in them. So he said, what my dad did, he redrilled the holes again. And then they replaced the ring over it. Now, if you look carefully, you need to go and look at this. But if you, if you look carefully at this bit here, now that is obviously an old timber. But that one, when you look close up, if you stand in front of it, it looks fairly new. Well, certainly not hundred years old and that might be one of the ones that they wanted to redrill so they keep it in the same have a look when you next go down see if you can spot any which could be modern ones and th these would have been done probably in the 1950s so having secured the exit from east hill the next thing was the hive and we're looking at a lovely prospect of the hive from 1741 and um we can see the town in the background the hive of course is, is a, almost like a little village community on its own about a mile away um, you can see the church and the little community there and the royalists of course not only had they plundered the warehouses for supplies um, although fairfax did make sure they couldn't get any more supplies in or out because he he blockaded the entrance at mersey but they also um, commanded the church the royalists and turned it into like a little mini fort if you like um, a churchyard for uh, maybe one or two hundred men. So eventually um, it was captured. Here we've got some Leonard's Church um, as we know it on the left uh, on the 14th of July. Now that it didn't take long to capture apparently. Um, Carter says that it was only about two hours. Those who weren't captured or killed they just ran back into the town and got away and um, so that was that they, they'd lost that era here the door which you can see in this porch here 15th century door has still got damage which they believe uh, occurred during the siege in the form of these little what they believe may have been loopholes where they would have pointed their muskets through as they were defending the area um, i don't know whether that's proved but that's what is believed to be the case so they've now got the hive the next thing almost within a day um Fairfax decided to do something about St John's Green. So the Royalists still held the great Lucas house, the family home, and, and all the grounds, all the walled area, and also the gatehouse. And um, what they did, they launched a big attack. They, they attacked, first of all, virtually destroyed the, the Lucas family home, and they desecrated the place. And after that, um, I mean, after this little battle here, I'm, I'm gonna talk about in a moment, and, and this shows you again what people do in times of war. Apparently many of the, the parliamentary soldiers went into St Giles Church um, where the Lucas family crypt 
votes were and they went in there and they um, found the votes of to Charles Lucas's mother for one thing uh, who'd only died about a year earlier and I think one of the aunts and they dismembered the corpses I mean they still hadn't properly um, de decomposed and they pulled the hair out and they were wearing the hair in their hats um, this is what was reported um, anyway but then the gatehouse was very strongly defended and they had their armory in there um, uh, ammunition and all sorts of things a couple of hundred men or more um, defending that and this is where Fairfax um, needed to employ a forlorn hope again or ask for volunteers to help him out here and um, on from a parliamentarian diary this is what is said our general resolved to storm the gatehouse whereupon six soldiers for three shillings each undertook to throw in grenadoes grenades and 20 men to carry ladders for half a crown apiece. Now these grenadoes are what we might loosely call today Molotov cocktails. They were, they were cylindrical um, vessels. They could be iron, they could they'd be brittle, they had to be hollow, could be iron, they could be glass, they could be pottery, um, could be anything, anything that would break easily. And they would fit in the palm of your hand nicely and they would have a little fuse or a little entrance point where you could pour the gunpowder fill with gunpowder you have a little thing where you could fill it in and then a little fuse sticking up a, a slow burning fuse because to give the person who's going to throw it a fighting chance so anyway they um they got the volunteers obviously six of them and um despite being attacked and some of them might have been killed or wounded they managed to log one of these um grenadoes into the gatehouse and it set fire to about four barrels of powder and blew the roof off so but the the other thing of interest 20 men to carry the ladders 20 men to carry the ladders well these ladders apparently were 10 feet wide and 26 rungs high so say 20 feet high 10 feet wide and apparently six men went up them once in one go so they they quickly want to get men there and that's a, again as i said earlier that's a very dangerous job so half a crown each now these people were only earning about um probably at the most a shilling a day six shillings a week so it's a couple of three days work um as a, as a little reward for doing that plus they might get promotion if you look inside the gatehouse today you you'll see this fan vaulting come down at all the four corners um this one's okay that's on the right hand side but the one on the left as you go in there's the doorway going out it's badly damaged and uh, they reckon this happened during the time of the siege and it's never been repaired some say that looks like a track of a cannonball but i don't know but it's a d damage from the siege now i know you don't always get over to st john's abbey gateway but if you do um that's something worth pointing out perhaps more newsletters big battle big battle here um getting the gate now so on the left we've got a letter sent to the honorable william lenthal of the late fight at colchester and how the suburbs of the said town were fired by the lord goring lord capel sir charles lucas and the enemy in that previous illustration you saw the royalists they'd been defeated and they're rushing back into the town and what they did apparently was set fire to the buildings as they were going so as to not give an advantage to the parliamentarians whole streets were deliberately set on fire mainly by the royalists and at the end of the siege nearly 200 houses had been needlessly lost um, by that method and then we have over here this goes on for about four or five pages but to the honorable william lenthal speaker of the house of commons in my last i intimated to you that we hope to gain the gatehouse and the works about it and church all which the enemy had fortified very strongly and it pleased god well they thought it pleased god this afternoon about five of the clock to deliver all these places into our hands the manner was thus and they go on to describe how they did it we discharged four pieces of cannon altogether which much amazed the enemy in the works and then discharged four more and immediately our musketeers fell on and stormed the gatehouse with ladders and threw in hand grenadoes the enemy opposed very stoutly for a while and threw down several of the ladders 
but at last gave back. Some held out their handkerchiefs, others fired very fiercely. Yet notwithstanding, our men gained the work and part of the gatehouse. And throwing in a hand grenade, oh, where there was some of the enemy stood to their arms, it happened to lie amongst their magazine, consisting of about four barrels of powder, and blew up about 40 of their men. It pleased God that we had but one man hurt with that blow. All this evening our men have been digging and pulling out dead bodies of the enemy, finding here and there a leg and an arm by itself, and so on and so forth. So if you want the gruesome details, you can read about them in these newsletters. Having secured St John's Green, Fairfax has the high ground he wants. During, up until this time, he had, he had spent some time bringing 40 heavy cannon from the Tower of London to Colchester. They were pulled down here by um, teams of oxen, took about two weeks to get here. Um, and once he had those 40 heavy cannon, he could bolster his forces um, all around the town, but particularly had some heavy guns which he could put on um, St John's Green and aim it at St Mary's Church, and particularly that little gun on the top. So let's um, have, remind ourselves about what's going on here. On the left hand side, we've got the modern day view of the Tower of St Mary's. This is the art centre, of course. You'll see the, the bottom two thirds is medieval stone and the top part is an early 18th century rebuild because the church was battered during the siege. We often think the top was blown off, but there is actually um, a drawing of St Mary's dated 1669 that shows the tower just about in place, but the whole thing like a, a bombed out building, shall we say. But anyway, it had to be rebuilt. The whole church had to be rebuilt, apart from this bottom bit of the tower in, finished about 1714. I think the battlements were added in 1914, actually. Um, but anyway, the Royalists, um, not only had they put cannons on the wall here, they'd also managed to get a cannon up the top here. And you can just about see a little cannon sticking out the top there. Now, you can also see a, a cannoneer up there. Now, this man at the top of the top here, described by Carter in his account as the name, his name is Thompson, and he's also described in various other sources as the one-eyed gunner. Now, you remember when we were speaking earlier about the accuracy of cannon fire, uh, but there were some master gunners or cannoneers who were experts. Um, military historians call them absolute gunners. And there was only one absolute gunner in the entire siege of Colchester on both sides. And it was this man. And he was described that by a parliamentarian. I'll show you. This is from a parliamentarian diary. Tuesday last, 11th of July, Colonel Whaley mounted a culverin himself and fired at the Lord Goring's chief gunner, who hath done much execution, being an absolute gunner. That's praise indeed from your enemy. And fortune so joined herein that the shot be proved effectual, effectual to the loss of the gunner's life. Now, of course, this is another Charles Devon picture, by the way, which I'm sure you can see. Now, of course, this is the where the story about Humpty Dumpty comes from, because according to the legend or the myth, the, the cannon itself was nicknamed Humpty Dumpty. And when the, they blew the tower, they, they killed the gunner. The gun fell to the ground, broke to pieces and all the king's horses. I don't know what the king's horses have got to do with it. But anyway, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And, you know, that appears in um, fairy, fairy story books and nursery rhyme books even today. And yet it's not true. Well, 99.99% it's not true. But um, it, it's, I mean, it, sometimes I, I will even tell the story, but then I'll say, you know, that's, that's our version. We're not, it's not real. But apparently the, the story or the rhyme originated from an Oxford Don in the 1950s as a spoof nursery rhyme. And he put it out there to see what would happen. And at, at that time, he wasn't even talking about Colchester. He was talking about the, it was a siege engine in the siege of Gloucester. And at some stage, Colchester borrowed it um, for ourselves. But it makes um, a good story. Now, just to add on to this, in 19, um, sorry, 2014, I was put in touch with an American television company. I don't know if you've seen them, um, the American Travel Channel, 
it's called monumental mysteries and they contacted me and they said something like hey we want to come over and do a story on hunky dumpty <laughs> and we're going to come over to all our film we're going to make a show and all the rest of it and they said we'd like you to meet you there and so on and i said i remember saying well look before you get on your boat and you know how are you going to get here and spend all the money coming here you realize it isn't true the story and their reaction was something like well, we don't care whether it's true or not <laughs> we're not going to let the truth get in the way of a good story so they came and um i met them in the churchyard um they took pictures from remote things um i forget what they're called you know they from high up drones and things like that and um i was filmed in the churchyard quite a lot and then we went to the george hotel where they did more interviews and all the rest of it and then it's um if you look on monumental mysteries website it's it was in july 2015 it was broadcast and it's one of these programs it's about an hour long but they tell three different stories so they'll start off say with cultures to siege then they'll go on to another story then another one then come back to, to keep the interest going and when you look at it i mean i had to play along with the, the jumbo bit but you know they had these cannons firing smoke imagine a hollywood movie of the civil american civil war that's what they turned the siege of culture into you get a chance have a look i, I thought this was interesting because I mean, I have heard some historians actually say that it wasn't a cannon on top of St Mary's Tower. It was just a large gun, if you like, a, a handheld gun. But Matthew Carter particularly describes it as a saker. And um, so this is a Civil War list of ordnance published, 1646. And in describing a saker, it's it's 2,500 pounds. Okay, over a ton in weight. Um, it's nine feet long so it's really heavy and people might think well how do they get it up there well you could go back well how did they get the church bells up into the towers all over the country which often weigh half three quarters of a ton each they did it so that wouldn't have been a problem and but here you can see some of the other larger cannons look and um the saker for example at point blank distance point blank range it would fire a cannonball 360 yards now point blank range means with the barrel horizontal but if you raise the barrel 10 degrees look how far the range is over a mile and some of them look two and a half thousand yards nearly and if you put the elevation up a bit more depending on how much pad you're using it might even go further so as the time goes on and they've encircled the town the forts are all the way around it things are getting quite hard for the townsfolk food is drying up we know that they were taking the thatch off the houses to feed the horses and in turn we know that hundreds of horses were slaughtered and used for food by the end of the siege it's reckoned that about 700 horses had been slaughtered and the problem was that many of this this horse meat had maggots in it and the, the soldiers were suffering from something called flux so it's a terrible time the people were starving the the siege was slowly having its effect certainly by about the first week second week in august and it really was a case of starvation or surrender according to matthew carter he says yes the horse flesh was full of maggots they were eating dogs cats rats and candles these would be tallow fat candles and matthew carter also states that one side of a small dog was sold for six shillings that's not the whole dog that's one side now it's a bit difficult to compare prices uh, from 400 years ago to today and you could compute it in different ways anything six shillings could be anything from 50 pounds now on the retail price index up to about 15,000 pounds but I decided to do it on average income because I thought well six shillings I, I know that a soldier would earn about a shilling a day if he's lucky and um, so he might have earned six shillings a week so that would be his wages for a whole week so today I, 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 I did check recently uh, the average income um you know the minimum income is about 540 or something pounds so yeah over 500 pounds if you base it on average labor costs or average income that's, that's quite amazing would you pay that for a nice piece of meat you might do if you were starving and then we finally come up to the time where 
we're getting ready for the surrender. We have this, this is interesting for the people who want Cogs to become a city look, a declaration of the besieged soldiers in the city of Colchester and their resolution concerning the surrender of the said city. And then they talk a bit more about what they've done. Also the planting of two demi cannon against it and the battering down of part of St Mary's Church. That's where the one-eyed gunner got it. And then because all the cavalry had lost their horses on the royalist side, they, they, they couldn't fight with horses, so they were grabbing anything they could and they would use pickaxes, um, pitchforks, scythes, and um, we, get an ind we get an indication of that here, look. This is what the parliamentarians are saying that the royalists did. And how a party of Lord Capel's shavers, they're called, issued forth of Buttle's Gate and set upon our pioneers and took some prisoners and hewed one of our men to pieces with their scythes. Moreover, the taking of Differs, Differs horse from underneath the walls. These scythes could be really dangerous. If you're being charged out on with someone on horseback, you could take the legs of a horse off if, you're, you get a, if you get the swipe right. And on the right hand side, finally, uh, the Scots, which had turned sides again, they were now fighting on the king's side. They had marched down. Fairfax was probably going to try and meet the Scots. He was probably going to stop in Colchester for a while, head north up the A1, meet the Scots. But the Scots were finally defeated by Cromwell at Preston, and they knew help wasn't going to come. And almost on a daily basis, towards the like the third week in August, many of the women and the children and the men of the town were almost falling down on the road outside Goring's quarters every day, begging to be let loose. Apparently, Kate Carter said they beat the men off with their guns, but the women refused to move. Um, you know, they, they would rather die than suffer starvation. And uh, eventually, Goring did actually open the gates and allow some of these women and vulnerable people to leave. Probably Northgate, because when they went out of Northgate, Colonel Rainsborough, who had one of the forts on that side, started firing upon them. So these poor people, starving women, children, he started firing on them. And, um, and they kept going. And then he told his men, if they don't stop, strip the women naked. And finally, they stopped and they turned around to go back in the town, but the, the gates were shut, they couldn't get back in. So they're caught in no man's land. Now finally, of course, Goring opened the gates and let them back in. And you might think, well, why is Fairfax being so mean, so hard-hearted? The poor vulnerable let them out. But of course, Fairfax knew if he let them out, there'd be less food, you know, the food would go round for more, in, you know, Colchester would last, the siege would go on for a bit longer. It's costing about £4,000 a week to maintain a siege. It's a lot of money. So he kept them shut. He wanted to keep the pressure on. So the Goring, Lucas and Lyle finally asked for terms of surrender. They had been offered terms of surrender numerous occasions during the siege and they had refused them all. And every time you get a new term of surrender, it's harder than the last one, if you know what I mean. So... Fairfax wrote back saying, we'll offer all the ordinary soldiers fair quarter. And for all the officers, we'll offer mercy. So they look at this and they write a note back to Fairfax. Can you please explain what you mean by fair quarter and what you mean by mercy? Fairfax sends another messenger back saying that by fair quarter, we mean they will not lose their lives. They will lose their arms, they won't be injured, and they will maintain their clothing. That was for the common soldiers, about over 3,000 of them. As for, the, as for mercy, he said, your fate will be determined by Parliament. And he wouldn't be drawn any further. But they had no argument. They had to sign the surrender document. Here's a copy of it. It was signed on the 27th of August. 1648 and some of the details of the term of surrender on the left hand side all horses and their equipment to be gathered into St Mary's churchyard all arms colours and drums to St James church all private soldiers and inferior officers to be gathered into Friars Yard presumably this is the Grey Friars Yard near Eastgate all other officers to the King's Head this is off Head Street, and all to be accomplished by 11 o'clock on Monday the 28th of August. That was the surrender day. 
And on the right hand side, you can see the prisoners. You look at the bottom total, there's over three and a half thousand people taken prisoner at the end of the siege on the 28th of August. And you can see at the top, Earl of Norwich, Goring, Lord Capel, Lord Loughborough, 11 knights. They would include Lucas and Lyle, nine colonels and so on and so forth. Down towards the bottom, 3,067 private soldiers. And note also 65 servants to the lords and gentlemen. They were all taken prisoner. Now, of course, what happened, the, the common soldiers were treated badly, apparently, at the end of the day. They were beaten. They were mistreated. They were bundled around England in various castles. And eventually, most of them ended up being sent to the West Indies or Jamaica to work on the plantations. The, the officers, um, after Fairfax arrived in the town, he came into town about two o'clock in the afternoon on that day. He rode around the defences and then he rode into the old Moot Hall where a council of war was held. And that council of war was also attended by Ireton, some of the other leading men. And they decided that an example had to be set and four of the royalist officers were sentenced to death. And they included George, Sir George Lucas, Sir George Lyle, Sir Bernard Gascoigne and Colonel Henry Farr. Colonel Henry Farr probably because he was the one who captured the sitting committee, Essex Committee for Parliament at Chumsford at the beginning um, of this siege. So in the meantime, the, the Royalist officers were told to assemble here. This is where all the officers, the King's Head Assembly Room, which is now a solicitor's office, um, off of Headgate. And they sent a little detachment to get them. And when they got there, they found that Henry Farr wasn't there. He had somehow escaped. Now, Carter says that he was retaken, but he's the only one who says that. And I can't find any other recollection of him being tried or taken to a court or anything, apart from the fact I know he was the governor of Langard Fort about 30 years later. So he got away with it somehow. But anyway, the other three, Lucas, Lyle and Gascoigne, were brought to hear their fate at the Moot Hall. They were told they were going to be sentenced to death. And of course, they... There was a bit of an outcry. They were called traitors and what have you. And apparently Lucas said, look, OK, they were resigned to their fate. Could the execution be delayed for a while, a day or two? I need to write letters to my family. I've got things I've got to do. And it was Ireton, apparently, who said, no, you are to prepare for immediate death. And they were taken to the castle and about seven o'clock, in the evening behind the north wall of the castle, um, they were led out to the executioners. The officers in charge of the execution squad was Ireton, Rainsborough and Whaley. And the first who was called up was Sir Charles Lucas. He stood there, apparently first of all knelt down in prayer. He then stood up, said a few more words, and then he, he got his courage and he opened up his doublet apparently said, all right, traitors, do your worst. And the firing squad, who were 20, 20 25 yards away, um, all fired, and he was hit four times, and he fell down dead. And then Lucas, um, Lyle rather, we can see Lyle here, comes out. Apparently, he bent down and kissed his friend, and then he too knelt in prayer before standing up and obviously and making a short little speech and handing some money out to the, some of the executioners and what have you. And then he was also... Um, dispatched in the same manner. And then it was the turn of Bernard Gascoigne, who apparently had already got his coat off. And um, right at the last minute, they said to him, stop, you're going back to your friends. And um, it turned out that he wasn't, his name wasn't Bernard Gascoigne, but it was more like Bernardino Gascoigne. And he was a Florentine, a gentleman of Florence. And at some stage during his captivity, maybe when he asked for a letter to write to his family, they realised that he couldn't write very well. He was obviously not good at English. The message must have gone back to the Council of War and probably Fairfax um, decided that they would reprieve him. But they weren't going to tell him that until he'd watched his friends die. They probably thought that if we execute him, he's obviously a gentleman, um, Italy, the financial centre of Europe at the time, we could put the lives of English travellers in danger for a generation if we kill him. So he was let go 
uh, he was banished. He went and he didn't ret he returned to England in 1669 with the Grand Duke Cosimo III of Tuscany on a grand tour of Britain. And apparently he brought his Grand Duke here and stood him on the spot where he watched his, um, his comrades murdered. This is the spot today. Um, the obelisk marks the spot. Um, you can read the writing on. This stone marks the spot where on August 28, 1648, after the surrender of the town, the two royalist captains, Sir Charles Lucas and Sir George Lyle, were shot by order of Sir Thomas Fairfax, the parliamentarian general. So whether it was Ireton or not, Fairfax was the one in charge. He was the one with the ultimate responsibility. Apparently, although this was put here about 1892 when the park was opened it apparently stands on top of an earlier stone apparently er, right in the early times there was a little white a little wooden cross then there was a stone put there and there was a stone there if you look on the 1876 500 series ordnance survey map you can see the stone there in situ 1876 and about 25 yards away that way is another stone on the map, clearly marked on the Ordnance Survey map, and presumably that was where they were shot, that's where the executioner stood. That's what the theory is, and the stones seem to prove that. Not long after the siege, in, 15, in 1656, the travel writer uh, John Evelyn visited Colchester. This is what he had to say. On the 8th of July, he said, to Colchester, a fair town, but now wretchedly demolished by the late siege especially the suburbs, which were all burned, but were then repairing. At the outside of the castle, the wall where Sir Charles Lucas and Sir George Lyle, those valiant and noble persons who so bravely behaved themselves in the last siege, were barbarously shot and murdered by Ireton. He knew who the, the main culprit probably was in cold blood. And he says the place was bare of grass, for a large space, all the rest of it abounding with herbage. And that was a tradition that went on for quite a while. Even Morant mentions it in his um, history of Colchester, that the grass wouldn't grow on the spot where these people fell. Now that may have been because people were tramping over it as a little tourist spot, we don't know. But anyway, the grass still doesn't grow there, does it? Because of the, the tarmac. Um, now at the time of the restoration, um, Lucas and Lyle were properly buried. Uh, on the, in June 1661, there was a massive civic funeral with full honours. Um, and this marble slab, we can read here, the marble slab was laid over the grave of Lucas and Lyle in June 61, when a funeral with full civic honours was held in the town. It was reported that the long funeral procession to St Giles Church was followed by at least 10,000 gentlemen and inhabitants of the town and the county. And this marble slab was laid over the tombs and it's now in the Masonic Hall on the North Chapel wall and there's a copy of it in the castle. And it says, under this marble lie the bodies of the two most valiant captains, Sir Charles Lucas and Sir George Lyle, knights who for their eminent loyalty to their sovereign were on the 28th day of August, 1648, by the command of Sir Thomas Fairfax, then general of the parliamentarian army in cold blood barbarously murdered now at the end of the sea by this time you know the war is over fairfax has gone back to his family um, although he was a parliamentarian his daughter had married the duke of buckingham who was a royalist and they thought this was a terrible slur on the fairfax family name and the duke of buckingham asked king charles ii to have it erased and this is what happened next. After it became known to the Fairfax family, follow me from the top, that the marble slab had been displayed on the tomb of Lucas and Lyle and contained such wording, which they thought brought a great slur on the family name, the Duke of Buckingham, who had since married Fairfax's daughter, approached King Charles II and requested that the epitaph be erased. Lord Lucas, Sir John Lucas, Charles's brother, agreed to abide by the King's decision so long as he could replace the original inscription with one that declared that Lucas and Lyon had been barbarously murdered for their loyalty to King Charles, your father. I'm not sure he said that, but that's what he meant. And that his son had ordered this memorial of their loyalty to be erased. 
Well, he made his point. And on the king's order, so it was said, the original epitaph was carved in as deeply as possible. Now, at the end of the siege, in order to avoid the town being plundered by the soldiers, because normally after a siege, what would happen? The soldiers would be given 24 hours to plunder the town, for example. In order to avoid that, Fairfax imposed a fine initially of £14,000 on the town. Two or three million pounds a day, perhaps. A lot of money. And don't forget, the town was in dire straits. Trade had come to a standstill. They were suffering, they were ill. The, the Dutch weavers hadn't been able to sell cloth for the entire siege. They were struggling. And um, so Fairfax eventually remitted £2,000 of this. So that left the town being fined £12,000. And the townspeople made the Dutch, who only represented about 10% of the population, they made them pay half, 50%. Now, later on, when Fairfax realised the poor of the town needed help, he gave another £2,000 back. So the, the Dutch had paid half, the town got £2,000 back, and of that, they only gave the Dutch £100. They couldn't win, <laughs> could they really? And the, the grave that's in St Martin's Parish Churchyard, which we spoke about last time, of Jakob Ringer, um, he paid £10 toward that fine. But um, there they are queuing up to pay the fine. We've got a receipt here um, from, it says here, Colchester, August 30th, 1648, received by virtue of a warrant from His Excellency, the Lord Thomas, Lord Fairfax, bearing date 29th inst of John Rebo, the son, the sum of four score pounds, 80 pounds, being in part payment of the 10,000 pounds agreed to be paid by the town of Colchester upon the surrender of it as a gratuity to the soldiers. So they paid all this money and um, supposedly stopped the town from being badly plundered. So many of the, so Luke's and La, we know, suffered the ultimate penalty. Many of the other officers were given to the regiments. They were given to the regiments in as much as, you know, they were handed to the regiments to be ransomed to their families. So they'd have a, a colonel or, or a captain or someone given to one of the regiments and then their family would have to pay to get him back again. So that's, that's how they got some of the money. Um, the peers of the realm, Loughborough and Capel, couldn't be tried by Fairfax, um, that they are way above his station. So they would be tried by their peers in Parliament, as would Lord Goring. Now, Capel and Goring were taken to Windsor Castle. Later, Capel was transferred to the Tower of London, um, from which he escaped. One of the very few to do so, as you can see in this illustration here, and apparently he escaped and he was given a ride by a waterman. Um, over to some other part of the Thames and um, he was betrayed I think for 40 pounds reward so and he um, there was quite a trial you can read all these trials if you're interested but he was finally beheaded um, not long after Charles the first had suffered in Whitehall. Goring now we can see two people here William Lenthal who I've mentioned a few times and Goring. Goring was tried by his peers in Parliament and he was found guilty but he of treason but he appealed and on appeal the verdict was split even stevens and the speaker of the house of commons had the casting vote now according to matthew carter's account apparently at some stage prior to all of this um goring had advanced lenthal a large sum of money when he was in need and i suppose this was payback time because Lenthal came down on the side of Goring and he was let off and he went back to his, his estates, etc, etc. And here we've got um, an account of the various houses that were destroyed during the siege. Uh, you see some of them are listed by Parish, 186 altogether. And, and finally, um, I thought I'd just show you this. This is um, a page from the Borough Assembly book. And um, it's the first meeting uh, immediately after the end of the siege. And although Colchester um, had hosted this large royalist army, you know, for about three months during the siege, um, if anything, Colchester stood for Parliament. 
So it's no surprise really that um, at this particular meeting, if you notice, you'll see lots of names have been struck through, you know, maybe 10 or more of them. And these were known to be royalist sympathizers. And this was the, the first opportunity really of purging them from the corporation. But you know, at least um, there must have been a sigh of relief. They, you know, the war was finally over. Um, they can hopefully look forward to the future with a bit more optimism. I know it's been devastating times, you know, they're, they're, they've been starving, they're, all employment and occupation has probably come to a complete standstill. Um, the, many houses and roads have been destroyed by fire. It's all going to take a lot of rebuilding, but uh, at least, you know, they've got the future to look forward to. But of course, they didn't know what was going to happen next. And less than 20 years later, we know that not only Colchester, but the whole country really was hit by the devastating Great Plague. And in Colchester, nearly half the population were to lose their lives at that terrible time. But I'm going to finish now. I'm just going to conclude by just pointing out another couple of um, sources you might be interested in. I've mentioned some of these before. On the left hand side, we've got the Siege of Colchester leaflet. This, this opens up into quite a large um, piece and it's, it includes that large siege map in the middle, which I showed you right at the beginning. And over here on the, the right hand side, a lovely little diary of the siege by Daphne Woodward and Chloe Clockrell, former librarians at Colchester. And what this, how this diary is different, what they've done, they've taken um, pieces from all other diaries and other news books and other sources and wove them into one general diary and it's a blow by blow account of the whole 11 weeks of the siege and at the end of that there's also a very useful bibliography and some references that um, you can find further information from so i'm going to finish there um, i hope that's been of some interest to you and uh, thanks for listening in